Hello and welcome to Forgotten Fronts. I am Jeremy, and today's episode will be playing the mission No Warning, where we take him out of Lobao 6 Corps to halt the Prussians as they emerge from the Bois de Paris. But first, the history. If you don't want to hear the history, a time will come up on your screen. Wait for it. Now! At the beginning of the battle at 11.30, Napoleon saw a cloud of dust from the direction of St. Lambert. He and his staff looked at it with their telescopes. Some said they were troops at the halt or on the march, while others said it was even a clump of trees. However, it was the Prussians closing their columns at St. Lambert. In response, Napoleon moves the foot guard by La Belle Alliance and sends out Demont's Hussars to scout to the east. While on patrol, the Hussars capture a Prussian NCO from the 2nd Silesian Regiment with a letter to Wellington from Bulow. On questioning, the Silesian Hussar said that the cloud of dust was Bulow's vanguard and that the army spent the night at Wavre and saw no French troops. Little did the French know that the Prussians had been watching them for several hours. At 4 p.m., half of Bulow's infantry and all of his cavalry crossed the Lausanne and entered the Bois de Paris. It was at this point the scout cavalry clashed with earnest with their French counterparts. With support from the Prussian artillery that was more to announce the arrival of the Prussian army, the French cavalry was dispersed. The French artillery soon responded, beginning an artillery duel as the infantry moved up. Lobau's 6 Corps had 13 battalions of infantry, 11 squadrons of cavalry, and 36 guns, numbering around 10,000 men. They were outnumbered, however they were crack troops. He deployed his division astride the road to Placino, on the high ground south of the village. This not only protected the army's flank and rear, but the Brussels to Charleroi Road, the main line of communication and retreat for the French army, and La Belle Alliance, Napoleon's field HQ. Bulow's IV Corps, on the other hand, had 34 infantry battalions, 29 cavalry squadrons, and 94 guns, numbering around 24,000 troops. These were mainly militia, but they were highly motivated. They deployed on either side of the road, and had several light battalions deployed on their flanks to make their force appear larger, as at this point they were in short two brigades, which made them closer to around 15,000 troops. Before the two other brigades could arrive, Blücher saw another attack massing to hit the Allied line, and received a message that the attacks on the Allied line had made the situation serious for them, and so he ordered Bulow's troops to advance. Bulow's troops advanced in an all-arms attack, screen by skirmishers. Lobau quickly responded with charges from Domon's light cavalry and Sobie's lancers to slow down the Prussians. The cavalry threatened the skirmish line and made one charge before being driven off by the Prussian cavalry. The battle against the English still roared along the ridge, smoke from which blankets it and rolls across the surrounding countryside. The guns echo in the small valley as Marshal Laval looks over the brigades of his corps in double line facing the woodland beyond which the Prussian army approaches, their black soldier flags hanging from their staffs. In front of them, the lancers and chasseurs of Cheval held the line bravely despite being heavily outnumbered. The sounds of bugles crying and the screams of horses and men could be heard on the other side of the woods, slightly unnerving Laval's veterans. Marshal Laval dispatched a courier to the large infantry brigades to his front to split off skirmish companies to line the woods. The marshal watched as the courier splashed away and hoped that the skirmish line was enough to delay the Prussians while he set up a defensive line in the rear. As he watched the brigade react to his orders, an exhausted courier burst from the wood. The rider's horse was wet with sweat and mud. From his uniform, Laval could tell that the courier was from the cavalry. As the rider galloped toward him, the rider's worried expression became more and more visible. Once he arrived, he handed him a damp dispatch which said the cavalry was holding back the large Prussian force from the Bois de Paris and requested immediate support. Knowing that his corps was under strength, he did not send new orders to his battalions but planned to support the skirmish lines with the smaller brigades to the rear. The leftmost skirmish companies now entered the woods, spreading out amongst the trees, taking a knee as wet sticks broke beneath their feet. Silently watching the Prussian menace now advancing in calm, struggling in the knee-deep mud. Beyond the wood line, the cavalry skirmish continued and sabers clattered and pistols cracked as the cavalry whirled about. Our cavalry made a good account of itself, holding back the hordes of Prussian cavalry. The marshal sent out another wave of orders, ordering the rear brigade to advance to support the skirmish company. The advance was led by Budwin's brigade on the left and Bonnie's brigade on the right, while the parent brigades and the skirmishers were sent to the rear.
Then the guns of the 1st Battery of the 8th Artillery IPA were sent to support the center of the heavy skirmish line, the horses and men struggling under the mud laboring under the gunner's whips that cracked like bullets overhead. In the rear, the leader of the artillery rode back and forth impatiently, unable to see the Prussians. The commander turned to the nearest battery, shouting to them to line up into a firing line by the field. As they lined up, the gunners adjusted their cannon by elevating the screws. To get his men moving and to inspire them, Marshal Lebel personally rode up to the skirmish line, yelling inspiring words and waving his sword about. A battery of Prussian guns advanced to the crossroads, threatening on nearby skirmishers. He responded by leveling their muskets and firing, then running to the next trees while yelling mock orders to make it seem as though their numbers were far greater. Their bullets clattering on the carriages and thudding into the gunners, who let out terrible screams while falling into the mud. Seeing the skirmishers, the 3rd squadron of the 11th Chasseur au Cheval galloped toward the battery to chase them off. At the same time, the skirmishers in the center had arrived at the edge of the wood. Kneeling and pulling back the heavy hammers of their muskets concealed in the wood, they watched the cavalry. In the center, the cavalry skirmish continued, our cavalry fighting desperately and heavily, hoping for its support from the infantry. On the right, an artillery battery thundered, firing on the Prussian horde, cutting bloody channels in their assault columns and shrouding the guns in smoke. As they fired, the gunners nervously boat to the cavalry skirmish in the center, hoping that our cavalry would hold the line. Marshal de Camp Bonnier saw the battery and raised his sword, sending his brigade to support the battery. As two of the brigades advanced to the steady beat of a drum, Marshal Lebao sent couriers galloping to them, directing the brigades to take direct control over them from their leaders. The two larger brigades take up position in the rear, hoping to use their many seasoned troops to halt the Prussian advance in the open through maneuver and drill. At the front, the cannon battery boomed as the gunners handled their cannon with swiftness and precision. The gunners blackened by powder smoke, their sweat covering rivers to the black layers. As the nearby Prussian shells exploded overhead, raining their razor-sharp shards of metal down, cutting up the earth. Nearby, a chasseur of cheval squadron regrouped by the first battery of the 8th Artillery IPA to move back into the fray. The officer waved his sword in the air. The skirmishers kneel in the woods, awaiting the command to fire, taking cover behind the trees as the guns of their battery arrive just behind them. Budwin moves his brigade closer to the center, their flags waving in the wind and his men involuntarily ducking as his shells screech low overhead. His men march to the center of the wood where it parts for the road, and the Prussians risk advancing through the gap, easily pushing back our skirmishers. Bonnie's brigade halts and forms his men into column of division, his men grimly looking through the trees for the Prussian foe, their minds conjuring up images of crouching skirmishers in the trees. The gunners of the 1st Battery of the 8th Artillery PA to their left unloaded to their guns and began to thunder, jutting out large clouds of smoke and flame, blasting the advancing Prussian with ball and shell. The gunners of the 1st Battery of the 8th Artillery PA to their left unlimited their guns and began to thunder, jetting out large clouds of smoke and flame, blasting the advancing Prussians with ball and shell. As the battalions of Bonnie's brigade halt and detach their own companies of skirmishers to protect their exposed artillery on the right, which came not a moment too soon as the outnumbered cavalry began to be pushed back. To inspire his men to press on to the edge of the wood, Marshal Lebel moves into the gap in between the wood, pointing his sword directly at the men and then to their position, yelling encouraging words to them. 
The battalions of Barney's brigade were then positioned along the skirmish line to support them against the Prussian cavalry, halting the Prussian cavalry in a hedge of bayonets. On the extreme right of the line, more skirmish companies were detached from the Barney's brigade, beyond which the other brigade of cavalry and battery of cannon fight a losing battle to hold back the Prussians. To the center, the cavalry had had enough and were falling back. The commander of the squadrons were ordering their men to rally in the rear with varying degrees of success. One of the horsemen fell from the saddle as a Prussian cavalryman fired his pistol at him, covering his saddle in a sheet of crimson. Marshal Lebau turned his head and refused to look on the one squadron who surrendered, many of whom were taken prisoner by the Prussians. Their guide and bearer was caught by one of the cavalrymen and received two cuts in his chest, and their guide was taken. Despite this, Lebel was confident that he could hold the skirmishes along the woodline for a time, now that the cavalry was weakened. On the right, the skirmishers rushed through the wood, their footsteps crunching sticks and undergrowth as their bugler urged them forth with his horn. Behind the skirmishers, a line battalion advancing column of division marched into kettle drums. Beyond the woods, a regiment of cavalry was pushed back by the Prussians, and their supporting battery was now exposed and so Marshal Lebel ordered another company of skirmishers to the right. As one of the battalions marched to the right flank of our line, the skirmishers holding the extreme right of our line were under heavy canister fire from the Prussian battery across the road, heavy balls clattering against the trees and tearing the flesh of screaming skirmishers as they were in dire need for support. Keep up that fire, gentlemen! Keep up that fire! Pour it on them, you scrawny bastards! Jerome, get over here! Go to the marshal and send for support for the cavalry! The skirmishers moved to take cover among the trees, kneeling and blasting smoke and spark at the Prussian gunners. The artillery responds in turn by blasting canister, the balls whistling through the trees. As a runner flew by, he could see no cavalry squadrons or officers to give his orders to, except for a glimpse of Prussian cavalry in the forest across the road. A cannonball flew overhead, bringing down many branches and leaves on the skirmishers. All around him was the deafening boom of cannon and the far-off crackle of musketry. Beyond the forest, he could see the cavalry falling back to their rear and could see a sickening pile of struggling dead and dying horses and men. As a runner ran down the line, more battalions were sent down to the skirmish line to support the skirmishers. Then the runner ran into the Marshal of Val, reporting the situation on the left flank, and he authorized the 3rd Squadron of the 11th Chasseur Cheval, who regrouped nearby, to march to the left flank to support the skirmishers and chase away the guns. To the front, another squadron of the 11th were being driven back despite their best efforts as they were heavily outnumbered. The Prussians fired on the withdrawing cavalry, and some of the men fell from their saddle. On the right flank, the skirmish companies ran towards the deafening booms and the cannon that covered the woods with smoke. The battalion that was supporting them formed line in the rear. Soon after, a nearby cavalry regiment was also pushed back to the wood line, and so the battalion formed into column and moved up to support the now exposed battery of cannon. The battlefield had now become quiet, except for the booming guns on both sides, as the French battalions marched into their positions as the Prussian assault columns advanced to a steady, ominous drumbeat. On the extreme left, the 1st Battalion of the 107th Regiment of Lyon saw his opportunity to secure the left flank and to drive away the enemy cannon. On the extreme left, the 1st Battalion of the 107th Regiment of Lyon saw his opportunity to secure the left flank and to drive away the enemy cannon. By occupying a farmhouse in the open ground by a tangle of roads, so they advanced their column to take it. While the 3rd Squadron of the 11th Chasseur Cheval continued their trot to the left flank to support the skirmishers, in the center, the Prussian cavalry charged the exhausted 2nd Squadron of the 11th Chasseur Cheval and their men and bugles screaming, their sabers in the air. The 2nd Squadron, much to the disgrace of their nearby officer, fell back, despite his orders for them to charge to assist the other squadron. The Prussian cavalry charged towards the officer, but their objective was the withdrawing cavalry rather than their officer, who welcomed an honorable death rather than living through this humiliation. 
Our nearby skirmishers leveled their muskets and opened fire on the cavalry, but their panic shot whipped over the cavalry's heads. Marshal LeBau quickly ordered forth the two nearby battalions to form a square to ward off the cavalry with their hedges of bayonets and soot. The Prussian cavalry seeing them halted and eventually fell back, giving our nearby exhausted cavalry a chance to withdraw. On the left flank, the Prussians pushed forward a company of skirmishers. One of our own companies rushed up to meet them before they could enter the woods. The skirmishers fell back in the woods to take cover before trading fire with the Prussians. On the extreme left flank, the 1st Battalion of the 107th Regiment of Dune rushes forward to the farmhouse. An iron cannonball screeches into the woods to splinter one of the trees into matchwood. The 1st Battalion moved up the double in calm over the open ground before the Prussian artillery can adjust their aim. In the center, the Prussian skirmishers begin to trade shots with our own. The muskets spitting fire as the men rush to load their pieces, ramrods clattering in their barrels. As the skirmishers exchange fire with our own, the Prussian cavalry who threatened our guns advance but halt at the fire of our squares. Their lancers came right for us, but our square held firm. As the lancers halted and their bugler began to send out orders to the squadron to attack the nearby battery, our front faced the square over fire upon them, and their front rank fell in heaps. The squares blasted the Prussian cavalry who writhed as they fell from their saddles, and the other squadron charged past the left of the lancers and towards the cannon who replied with a blast of canister, felling a cavalryman who vomited blood as he fell. Between the canister and the fire in the nearby squares, the squadron halted, regrouped, and, and eventually fell back, allowing our gunners to move their cannon back to relative safety, grunting and swearing as they struggled against the sucking mud. In retaliation, the Prussians sent up two companies of skirmishers to pick off men from the closely packed squares. At the same time, they move up a battalion of infantry to push back the squares with the weight of their musketry. As the battalion advanced, the Prussian assault in the center was being checked for the moment. On the right, the situation was similar, as their infantry refused to advance at the sight of our cavalry in the woods threatening to trample them under hooves and cutting them with sabers. Taking advantage of the mass Prussian units, the 4th Battery of the 2nd Horse Artillery wheeled right to better bombard these mass troops. The gunners swabbed and loaded their guns before blasting them. In response, the Prussian cavalry thundered forth once again. Charging towards our exhausted cavalry from the wood, their hooves churning up the wet earth. Their lance points leveled like the knights of old toward the third squadron of the 12th Chasseur au Cheval who turned to face them. The two squadrons clashed, the lancers skewering many of the chasseurs out of their saddles. But as the lancers closed the distance, our cavalry parried with their lances and then cut with their sabers and were blasted with close range pistol shots. In the center, the Prussians resumed their attack and a battalion of landwehr halted to fire a splintering volume to one of our squares. As one of their squadrons makes another charge, chasing away a company of skirmishers, However, the faces of the nearby iron hedges of our squares disappear in smoke, filleting the squadron with musket balls which quickly halt them and then they fell back. The Prussians sent forth the same company of skirmishers that was previously driven back to fire on the squares once again. Our skirmishers emerge from the trees and immediately open fire upon them. On the right flank, the Prussian cavalry was pushed back, however ours was as well, by the musketry of a nearby Prussian square, allowing them to move up infantry columns. But the two squadrons, despite being exhausted, regroup. While the artillery on the right flank duels with their Prussian counterpart, protected by nearby skirmishers, as the Prussians bring out more troops. In the center, another infantry column slogs through the mud, in the blinding smoke supported by nearby skirmishers and cavalry. As another battalion fires muskets in quick cracks that blossom into smoke, as another squadron of cavalry charges, their vehicle screaming and chasing away one of our skirmishers, while taking heavy fire from a nearby square. The horses crash to the ground as men slid from their saddle, dropping saviors to clutch at bloody wounds until the squadron halted and regrouped. On the flank of Prussian assault column advanced on the farm, the commander of the regiment hopes that the farmhouse would be able to hold like the English one on the right of their line. In the meantime, the 3rd Squadron of the 11th Chasseur au Cheval moved to support the gap caused by the withdrawing skirmishers. As the thudding drums of another Prussian assault column advance, their flag waving in the wind, 
In the rear, a company of skirmishers dawdles and is ordered forward once again through the foul-smelling fog that hung like a dense mist in the forest. In the center, a battalion in square was under heavy fire from muskets. A man screamed as a musket ball found its mark and his uniform front soaked with blood. Then a cannonball screamed through, tearing a bloody gap in the square. Shortly afterward, two battalions in the center were formed into line and to face the Prussian battalions and skirmish companies. At the same time, the 2nd Battalion of the 5th Infantry de Lille moved forward into the wood, where fire crackled and men screamed. Seeing one of the larger battalions advance towards the Prussians, the 2nd Battalion adjusted their position to the center. On the right flank, three Prussian battalions advance, and so the 2nd Battalion of the 10th Infantry de Lille moved to the right flank of the horse artillery. In the meantime, two companies of skirmishers took up their positions in the woods, and so the 3rd Squadron of the 2nd Chasseur au Cheval charged them. As the cavalry approached, the skirmishers fired on the rightmost guns of the battery, but the cavalry soon drove them back. In the center, two Prussian line battalions approached our battalions who formed into square once again as the Prussian cavalry loomed nearby. As they passed by, Laval ordered them back into line once again. As one of them began to move, the Prussians fired a volley, musket flames piercing through the yellowish smoke, followed shortly by the screams of the men of the forward face of the square, their blood temporarily misting the air. On the left, another company of skirmishers was forced back by Prussian cavalry, but our cavalry countercharged, forcing back their squadron. In response, a nearby battalion formed square, and our skirmishers who regrouped nearby opened fire upon them. Our battalion formed line and opened fire upon the nearby skirmishers. Another company of skirmishers filled in the gap in the skirmish chain on our left. Fronts our militia advanced in a column, straight for us, yelling and cheering despite the cannon and musketry which card of their rank. What will stop them? Their battalion advanced towards our skirmish company, accepting a fuse light of fire without stopping, musket balls crashing into their ranks and splashing their fronts with blood. The battalion continued their advance, their formation broken up by stepping around dead and dying men, until they halted to form line. From behind the formation, another squadron of cavalry charged our line, and our two nearby battalions formed square. One of the cavalrymen was snatched from his saddle, his horse swerved, throwing the rider then galloping away in panic. The nearby battalion was then ordered back into line once again by the nearby officers. In the center right, the 1st Battalion of the 5th Infantry de Lille formed into line once again, all the while under fire from the two skirmish companies in the line battalion in the square. Thankfully, the nearby artillery battery belched canister into the skirmishers which shook them. They then saw our line battalion rushing into position which drove their companies back. On the right, another cavalry charge pushed back the squadron supporting the skirmishers. Marshal Laval looked through his telescope to any unit to reinforce the line, but none could be found. Then suddenly a beagle cried out, and a nearby skirmish company revealed themselves, firing a volley upon the Prussian squadron and halting them. At this point, despite being outnumbered, the line was holding, though unsteadily. In the center, a cavalry charge broke another one of our battalions, and the second battalion of the 5th Infantry Division was sent in to support the nearby battery. The exhausted 2nd squadron of the 11th Chasseur Cheval was sent to the left flank to replace the other cavalry squadron, while the 1st Battalion of the 10th Infantry Division was ordered back into line as the cavalry on their right was repelled by the battery firing canister. The 1st Battalion of the 5th Infantry Division rallied by the 2nd Battalion of Infantry Division. Both battalions were then sent into the fort to counter our practical advance, while two other squadrons advanced, forcing the battalion across the road to form square. The two battalions halted, then advanced again as musket balls whizzed all around their heads. Then the sudden appearance of two battalions covered by the nearby battery, blasting canister into their ranks, pushed back the Prussian skirmish company and threw the nearby battalion into this array. Laval looked into the thick smoke and knew that his men were in a difficult position as he saw two cavalry squadrons to his front, but then he decided to risk it and ordered the 1st Battalion into line once again.
father to the left, the second battalion of the 107th Infantry Division formed line and moved on to the flank of the Prussians, while the 11th Chasseur of Cheval moved up to force another Prussian battalion into square. The Prussians are here! Defend yourselves! Company A to the windows! Companies B, C, and D to the wall! The Prussian assault column made a determined attack on the farmhouse, supported by two nearby cannon. But the attack was made out in the open, which caused the battalion to take high casualties. The Prussians make another charge in the 2nd Battalion, 107th Infantry de Lille, their hoops thundering and kicking up clods of mud. A battalion moved quickly into square, and the squadron halted at the wall of bayonets, between which, in the centre of French Square, was a perfect hospital, as they came under heavy fire from musketry and shrapnel. In its hollow center, a man crawled across the blood and gore soaked ground and collapsed. However, to the right, two more Prussian assault columns marched out of the wood under their black flag and two ominous drum beats. Into the choking, roaring chaos of battle, two more couriers rode up to the marshal, reporting that the line was holding, but their brigadiers were not sure how long they could continue this. The couriers also reported that, in the rear of the right flank, two companies of skirmishers awaited orders, and the marshal of the battle ordered them forward at once and the two skirmish companies rushed through the underbrush through the smoke that smelled of rotten eggs. Nearby to one of these companies, a Prussian battalion was playing and firing and advancing towards our line, cheering, hoping that this would push back our formation. In response to the 3rd Squadron, the 11th Chasseur and Cheval galloped toward them, their sabers red with the blood of their comrades. In the center of all the 10th Infantry de Lille was under a heavy fire in a closely packed square. To their left, Prussian Lancers galloped towards the 2nd Battalion of the 5th Light Infantry, who fired a volley which ripped past their heads and murdered them so much that they stopped just short of them. The battalion took advantage of the squadron's shock state to quickly form square, which at the sight of this the squadron withdrew. The 1st Battalion of the 10th Infantry de Lille was less lucky, however, as an iron ball tore down the face of their square, ripping off limbs of soldiers who fell bellowing in pain. At the same time, a nearby Prussian battalion blasted the same face of the square. Their the officer ordered his men to fill in the gaps with his hoarse voice in the dryness of the smoke, and so their battalion was ordered to line once again so they could have their revenge. Farther to the right, the battalions advanced as dark figures in the smoke. They attacked the small skirmish line on the right, pushing back skirmishers from their cover, bullets thudding into their nearby trees. Another company of skirmishers rushed up to hold the line. Two Prussian battalions and a skirmish company pour heavy fire onto the battalion supporting the artillery battery. The battalion was forced into square by a nearby third of cavalry, and as a result, the front face of the square turned into a bloody mess. Their officer ordered them to fall back. His arm in the air was immediately slashed by two musket balls. He immediately pulled it down to clutch at his bloody arm, cursing. As the battalion in the skirmish line held desperately, the last two guns of the battery fell back to the fallback line as bullets hissed past. The horses labored under the whip as they struggled through the mud. In the rear, the first and third squadrons of the 12th Chasseur of Cheval were ordered forward in a desperate attempt to stop the battalions, forcing them to form square. The riders coaxed their scared beasts forward towards the chaos and noise of the losing battle. Seeing that the flank is collapsing, the commander of the 3rd Battery of the 1st Horse Artillery, without orders, withdraws his battery to the fallback position as well. Shortly afterward, another courier gallops up to the bow and reports the collapse to the right flank, and so he orders his cannons to the fallback line. As the 3rd Battery of the 1st Horse Artillery arrives, they are reprimanded by their commander in a voice that required hell itself. The Prussian attack in the center was stopped as more of their troops were diverted to the right flank of our line, except for a small force to stop Lebel from diverting forces from the center. One of their officers in the center was concerned that the line battalion would break after being engaged so heavily, and so ordered his skirmish company to rejoin their parent battalion. Seeing that it wasn't being engaged, the bow ordered his skirmish line left of the line to fall back to the fallback line. While the skirmishers fell back, a worried courier rushes over to Rabao and reports that the cavalry on the right flank needed support. At the same time, in the center of the line, another cavalry charge pushes back a battalion of light infantry out of the woods. But the trees broke up the cavalry formation, slowing down the charge, allowing the light infantry to escape. 
Laval then looks over to the rear with his telescope and begins to plan out how to hold the fallback line as he rides back to it, leaving the smoke in the battle. As he withdraws, the remainder of the skirmish line on the right flank falls back with orders to rejoin their parent battalions. Their faces blackened with smoke and streaked with sweat, their eyes wide with the horror of battle. At this point, Laval orders a general withdrawal of all troops in the first line at first possible convenience. We must fall back! Sir, the Prussians are right on top of us! To move us to the open will be our undoing! That is a direct order from the Marshal! Despite the insistent and persistent order of the Marshal and other officers, many of his units refused to retreat. The 2nd Battalion of the 5th Infantry to lean regrouped in the center and refused to retreat and the nearby skirmish company rejoined their ranks to continue the fight. But their commander quickly halted them and ordered them back, yelling, If we stay here, we will be destroyed on our own! The second squadron of the 11th Chasseur au Cheval and their commander were ordered to the fallback line as they were in no condition to fight, their gaudy uniforms stained black by powder smoke and cut by musket balls. In the center of one of our battalions, organized retreat turned into a pell-mell retreat as the Prussian musket balls buzzed around them, cutting up their colors. In the meantime, the left flank withdraws in good order. On the extreme left, a skirmish company rushes back as two shells explode overhead, bringing leaves, branches, and shrapnel on the soldiers below. Behind the withdrawing French troops, the Prussians made a general advance to the Yorkshire March, with their shrill fifes piercing through the smoke. A courier rode up to Labau, saying that the garrison that held the farm on the extreme left wing had taken heavy casualties and had abandoned the building. Labau ordered them to fall back to the fallback line along the road. Many other battalions in the center halted to face the advancing Prussians, and so Lobel sent out many runners to the battalions to order them back once again. At the same time, another courier came in from the other cavalry commander requesting support. Lobel scanned the center of the line, satisfied that the battalions were mostly falling back in good order, many of them in marching columns. The officers of the two skirmish companies ordered their men to move towards their parent brigade. On the right flank, the Italians fell back, with the Prussians right behind them, cheering and blazing musketry into their rear. On the extreme right, a squadron of Chasseur au Cheval hid by a village, while a nearby company of Prussian skirmishers watches over them, ready to open fire at any moment. 
The Bao looked at the state of the withdrawing battalions, companies, and squadrons, their eyes wide with fear. Men pushed the very edge of their endurance, their colors in rags from bullets and canister overshooting. All the while, the men in line wait, seeing a stream of withdrawing and retreating men. Men, I require you to hold your ground once again, for the Emperor requires more time to defeat the English. The battle drew to the rear, pointing his sword, directing his troops. While moving to the rear, he yelled valiant cries to his men as bullets clattered against the nearby trees. The men moved back through the mud, defeated and stooped low, their uniforms stained with powder smoke and mud. At the same time, the last column of infantry left the woods, followed by an officer telling his men to fall back to the fallback line and to gather their strength. Shortly afterward, companies of skirmishers rejoined their parent battalion to strengthen their ranks as three more battalions passed through the line. As the officer galloped from the tree line, his horse kicking up mud, two Prussian battalions burst from the wood, their drums beating and their colors held high. Seeing the Prussians advance, the men down the ranks prayed silently and crossed themselves, asking for forgiveness and protection in the coming contest of arms. Others waited, mouths dry and muscles trembling, making one last check of their muskets, sharpening their flints and clearing their hammers, all the while looking brutally forward at the massed infantry. In front of the advancing Prussians, the final officer galloped frantically back to our lines, kicking up mud from the horse's hooves, coating the belly of his mount. At the fallback line, the last of the battalions crossed to move into reserve. The battalions who hadn't faced the Prussians looked on worried. At the same time, the companies of skirmishers doubled to get to the line to rejoin their parent battalions, seeing the approaching Prussians. As the brigadier generals from the first line withdrew, Laval gave them command back over their battalions once again to reorganize and counterattack at a moment's notice. As the battalions withdrew, they passed through lines of cannon and angry gunners screamed at them to leave immediately as they need to keep up the pressure on the approaching Prussians. Two battalions huddled around one of the batteries and a fuming artillery officer ordered them to the rear. On the right flank, the marshal extended the brigade and combined a skirmish company back into its parent battalion to form a strong front to support the nearby battery of cannon. Laval also allowed the other brigade in the center to issue its own orders in the coming defense. A skirmish company by the other skirmishers regrouped and was ordered back to his parent battalion, but it was on the other side of the line. So they continued to the right flank, their hearts pounding in their chests as they looked over their shoulders at the Prussian advance. The battalions continued to the rear as the four battery of cannon continued to thunder on the approaching black columns, jetting smoke and flame in the air.
The brigade on the right flank was also allowed to issue its own orders in the defense. The skirmishers rushed over to the right flank to reinforce their apparent battalion, and they did not arrive a moment before the Prussians began their next attack. As a company of Prussian skirmishers rushed up to our left flank, muskets banging and swearing at our battalion. In the center, Prussian columns come under a heavy cannon fire. Iron cannonballs screech through the air, skipping like stones on a lake, hitting vulnerable columns, tearing off limbs while shells explode overhead, raining red hot razor shrapnel down, splitting the skulls. As the cannonballs tear through their ranks, the Prussian columns halt as they attempt to reorganize on the cannonball scarred ground. While a cavalry squadron gallops to their left, moving to charge our batteries, followed by two squadrons advancing along the road to support them. While the Prussians began their attack, one of our battalions was isolated and did not want to draw the attention of the Prussians, and so remained in the woods to the extreme left. A brave courier is sent to them, galloping up to them to order them to once again withdraw to the rear. However, now they must do it via the road on the extreme left flank. As it appeared they would be the first point of the Prussian attack, the brigade to our center deployed the 2nd Battalion of the 82nd Enfantry de Lille to extend their line to the right. The battalion rushed forward, its colors flying in the wind, and halting then to form line. Just as the Prussians arrived on the right flank, the brigade moved its line to face them, moving them at the double, despite the complaints of the threat of nearby cavalry, which had moved some of the battalions into square. The brigade in our center had similar plans, however this was a problem as the Prussians sent to face them were both infantry and cavalry. At the same time, the center brigade extends their line to the left with the 1st Battalion of the 82nd Enfantry de Lille. In the rear, the battalions of the first line had arrived, creating a significant reserve of muddy, bloody troops. A muddy and tired looking rider reported that the final squadron of Dominus Chasseur au Cheval were cut off and that the commander was captured. Lobau sent the rider back with orders for him to attempt to rejoin their forces but avoid contact with the Prussians. In the meantime, the Prussians had attacked our center brigade, threatening them with cavalry. Their leading battalion then poured a volley into their squares. The ground was quickly scattered with dead, rivulets of blood crossed the ground. They approached our battalion with their cavalry, and we formed a bastion with our bayonet-tipped muskets. Then their supporting battalion spat musketry into our ranks. One ball slashed one of my comrades so close to me that fragments from his skull cut my face. Seeing the squares of our brigade, the Prussian squadron of cavalry halted, facing the wall of bayonets, behind which our musket flames stabbed through the steel. One of our battalions formed into line, thumbing back the cocks of their muskets, and, and the squadron of cavalry, not wanting to face more fire, withdrew. On the left flank, a lone Prussian squadron advanced, a cannonball slashing down the ranks of horsemen, shouting the limbs of many mounts, who fell screaming in a manner much higher pitched than any human lung can produce. As the cannon bellowed, the battle looked to the right flank, where another squadron approached the brigade, whose three leftmost battalions formed square. In the center, two Prussian battalions advanced in column, a mockery of the Emperor's tactics, but our brigades formed into line and opened fire, their ramrods glistening in the sun. In the rear, officers bellow orders for their tired and muddy men to reorganize their brigades to more efficiently send reinforcements to the line by forming their brigades into maneuver columns. As the troops reorganized in the rear, a bugle rang out in the center as a Prussian squadron thundered towards the center brigade, driving back one of the battalions, slashing the backs of men as they fell back. A man fell with a pathetic sigh as a blade left his sucking flesh. The man slowed to a walk, then fell to his knees. As the squadron charged, it was fired upon by two squares on the flanks, the wet thuds of musket ball impacts causing many of the cavalrymen to fall from their saddles and their horses to crash to the ground. 
One of the men shot a wounded screaming horse who attempted to stand up, but let out a horrid scream. But after enduring this heavy fire, they soon fell back, and three of the nearby battalions formed into line to get revenge on the battalion supporting the cavalry. As they fired, smoke blinded them and the sound of their muskets deafened them, as their muskets leapt back into bruised shoulders. The 2nd Battalion of the 82nd Enfantry de Ligne stopped to form a square in the smoke and confusion, as they heard the hooves and thought another cavalry charge was imminent. In the meantime, the 1st Battalion of the 27th Enfantry de Ligne moved to the edge of the field to support them in firing from the hedges that lined the field. While our battalions created this firing line, a Prussian battalion supported by two nearby cannon unleashed all manner of fire, and the ground was soon littered with the twisted crying bodies of our battalion, also formed line, and moved to join the other battalions at the edge of the field. On the right side, the brigade had formed a line of squares as the cavalry had been threatening their line. Their commander ordered them forward to threaten the attacking Prussian flank. The brigade then slowly began marching forward, yelling, Vive l'Empereur! As their colors waved in the breeze and their eagles advanced, the men were glad to be on the attack again, when suddenly a Prussian battalion revealed itself from the shelter of a nearby wood, threatening their flank. This caused the officer to halt the brigade and ordered a battalion to counterattack, while three others continued on their original maneuver, leaving another battalion in reserve. This caused no small amount of confusion, however the brigade soon reorganized and continued its march. In the center, the Prussian cavalry thundered forth once again, sending out another battalion back in shameful retreat. The squadron was soon halted with musket fire from the nearby battalion and batteries. Their officer chased them, hitting some of the retreating men with the flat of his saber. The squadron was again forced back, the iron hooves of the horses again crushing the dead and dying in a bloody mess. In the rear, the other battalions were formed and were ordered to the front again, the tired men trudging through the muddy and bloody field, their colors powder-stained and torn. The Prussian cavalry make another charge, forcing another brigade back and cutting down one of the engagement's heroes. Men, stand your ground! Stand your ground against us! On guard, you bastard! The men ran like revival fugitives, the cavalry among them slashing at them with red sabers. Among the casualties was the leader of the brigade, who to this point had held the center most gallantly. The other battalion nearby formed square in response, some of them looking in shock at the cut-up body of their commander. On the right flank, the three battalions of the brigade moving to attack the Prussian left flank had halted to form square all along the road. Their tightly packed ranks were filleted by the heavy balls of canister fire belched from the nearby Prussian battery. Their commander then ordered the 2nd Battalion of the 5th Enfantry de Ligne on the flank of the isolated Prussian battalion. Despite the heavy fire they were under, the commander ordered the three battalions to cross the road and to drive the battery back. The battalion men stepped over the spilled gas and rivulets of blood. One of the battalions formed square once again despite the lack of enemy cavalry nearby. The Prussian attack in the center was met with failure, seeing the supporting squadron withdraw. The 1st and 2nd Battalion of the 27th Enfantry de Ligne charged through the muddy field to support the artillery battery's flank. In the rear, Boney's brigade was ordered to the farthest left flank to support Thévenet's brigade. Thévenet's brigade continued to move two of its battalions forward and the third formed into line, staring at the two Prussian battalions and squadrons that had reformed to its front.
As the two battalions advance, the 2nd Battalion of the 84th Infantry de Lien also reforms and is ordered into the reserve. The new commander gallops back, sending out a wave of new orders which confused the brigade and many of the battalions halted. As Stevenet's brigade adjusted the line and moved to fill in the gap in the center, a bugle rips through the smoke as the Prussian cavalry make another charge on our line. On the right, another Prussian battalion and two companies of skirmishers emerged from the shelter of the woods, and Febnet's brigade began to shift his line back while he continued to shout, rallying cries and waving his sword through the air. The three battalions break their squares to form a line along the road. As the Prussian artillery reorganized, their battery commander galloped away. As the three battalions advanced, the third battalion of the 11th Infantry de Lille advanced to a nearby tree in front of the battery. As the firing line formed up, the Prussians sent cavalry squadrons to halt their advance and to force them back into their bayoneted bastions. In the center, another Prussian cavalry charge was scattered as two battalions rushed into squares. The first battalion of the 27th Infantry de Lille doubled to support the squares as the Prussian infantry battalion marched up in column, emerging from the smoke to break them in a fusillade of fire, while the 2nd Battalion of the 84th Infantry de Lille moved into reserve. The division commander galloped forward to rally the brigade, not seeing the brigade commander in the smoke taking shelter in one of the squares. The two battalions that were formed into line while one forms a close reserve. The air was soon filled with the sound of rattling round rods and the needles of musket flames. On the right, a Prussian squadron attempted another charge and they were repelled when three of our battalions formed square and many of them were dropped by their fire until the squadron fell back. In the rear, our reserves move up in a curious fashion as the orders were drowned out in the din of battle and so the battalions advanced through the mud of the field while their commanders trotted down the road. The nearby cannon in the meantime blasted twisted metal through the ranks of the square. On the left, Bonnie's brigade halted then galloped over the open ground to catch up with the battalions of his brigade. Thevenet moved up the 1st Battalion of the 27th Enfantry de Lille to fire into the flank of the Prussian battalion as fire nibbled away at the square until it too formed line. On the right flank, the squares held firm despite the battery fire. However, the two battalions were slowly being pushed back by the now three Prussian battalions and two Prussian skirmish companies that continually emerged from the woods. Looking through the telescope at the situation on the right, Marshal Lobau ordered a final two squadrons of cavalry to counterattack the Prussians. Lobau dispatched the two squadrons under the command of Chef de Battalion, Musset, who moved to support the right flank. The squadrons took a while to respond, not hearing the bugle call, sounding thin in the thunder of battle. At the same time, the brigades were sent to the left flank and were formed into double line to support the battery, pouring canister into the flank of the nearby Prussian battalion. The cannon leapt back as gunners lit the port fires, while the other two guns of the battery withdrew to escape the Prussian fire. The Evanet's brigade in the center had two brigades in square due to the Prussian cavalry threat. The two battalions were ordered to form line once again, pouring fire into the Prussian battalions to their front. On the right flank, the line of squares along the road was formed into line once again, as more canister whistled and raped into their ranks. In an effort to remove them from the canister range of the nearby battery, the battalions on the farthest right were ordered back. In doing so, the 1st Battalion of the 5th Infantry de Lille filled a gap in the line that exposed their rear and covered the flank of the battalions engaging the Prussians in the forest.
Those brigades at this point received the support of two cavalry squadrons arriving on the right flank as one of their battalions broke and retreated to their rear after having their right flank hailed with lead. Despite the urgency of the situation, when the first cavalry squadron arrived, the cavalry commander did nothing, waiting for the other cavalry squadron to arrive before attacking the Prussians. Marshal Lebel looked through his telescope at the center of the line and considered sending up the other battalions that were in reserve. In the center, the Prussians make another abortive cavalry charge that was driven back by the three squares of Thevnet's brigade to the left of Bonnie's brigade. Now that the Prussian threat was pushed back, the guns of the 1st Battery Artillery de Pied organized themselves into a line behind the brigade. The attacks were a front halted except for a regiment of cavalry to hold our brigade in place. The 1st Battalion of the 5th Infanterie de Ligne was sent to attack the Prussians, replacing the other battalion who retreated. Then a trumpeter made a call on the second squadron of the 11th Chasseur au Cheval gallop force to reduce the fire of the Prussians by forcing the lines into square and driving back the skirmish companies. Then the bugles blare as the cavalry charge their battalions. The Prussians immediately reacted, forming their battalions into squares, their faces vanishing in a fury of smoke. The sudden volley pushing back the squadron. Lebel, seeing this through his telescope, sent the 2nd Battalion of the 107th Infanterie de Ligne to the right flank to support the other battalions. In the center, the Prussian attack resumes with a cloud of skirmishers, their snapping musket fire nibbling at the squares. In response, the 2nd Battalion of the 82nd Infanterie de Ligne and the 1st and 2nd Battalion of the 5th Infanterie de Ligne advance, extending the left flank of the center brigade. They advance in the flank of the skirmish companies to pour a great volume of fire upon them. As these battalions move into place, the 1st Battalion of the 82nd Infanterie de Ligne in square suffered under heavy fire as the men coughed, screamed, and clutched at their wounds. This punishment continued until their officer would take it no more and ordered the battalion into line. As the battalions wheeled to face the skirmishers, the two battalions of the 5th Infanterie de Ligne advanced in column yelling, Vive l'Empereur! Vive l'Empereur! Driving back one of the companies. The 2nd Battalion halted to form line, only to be ordered forward again by a scarlet-faced officer. At the same time, another three Prussian battalions advanced, the militia that formed their ranks being pushed forward by their sergeants and officers. As the third of their drums drew closer, on the right flank, two battalions who withdrew to get out of canister fire were still suffering from it, packed in the tight formation of the square. Despite the threat of cavalry on their flank, the first battalion of the 5th Infanterie de Ligne formed line and rushed to blast the right flank of the Prussians attacking from the wood. However, at the same time, iron balls tore down the ranks of the battalion, men fell screaming as they held shattered limbs. As they advanced, the commander of the cavalry sent forth another squadron to herd the Prussian battalions into square. As the squadron advanced, the 2nd Battalion of the 107th Infanterie de Ligne advanced along the road at the double, kicking up dust from the road. The nearby battery fired on the Prussians, black powder flared, debris lashing the gunners' cheeks as they swabbed and reloaded their barrels. As the engagement on the right side continues, two squadrons of Prussian cavalry charged, their bugle ripping through the smoke, waving their sabers and screaming. The 1st Battalion of the 5th Infanterie de Ligne, despite the air hissing with musket balls, rushed to form square just in time. To the front, all Prussian attacks had increased substantially, as six skirmish companies now covered the advance of three Prussian battalions. In response, two battalions of the 5th Infantry de Ligne pulled back to better protect the cannon battery. The 1st Battalion halts briefly as the skirmisher fire cracks around them. Many of the Prussian skirmishers were not well trained and their bullets cracked over their heads. To the right, other battalions formed to the line once again and hoped to push back the skirmishers with their sheer weight of fire. On the right side, three squares were formed along the road, and the cannon dis decimates them. Iron shards spat dirty death amongst their ranks, but the rugged squares held.
The rightmost square took an intense fire as bulls thudded into men while others spattered in the mud around them, and so they were ordered into line. As the other battalions withdrew, leaving them isolated, and so the battalion in the center of the formation was sent to support the right flank. Seeing the other two battalions withdraw, the third battalion also did so, confused in the blinding smoke and death and thunder of battle. The second battalion of the 107th Enfantry de Lille joins the fight on the right flank. The other squadron of Chasseur au Cheval galloped up to force the Prussian battalions into squares, but halted just short of its target. In the meantime, the battalion from the center of the formation had arrived to support the other battalions, musket balls kicking up dirt from the road. The commander galloped over to the other battalion just in time for a cannonball to cut through the rear rank of the battalion that he was rallying. In the center, two Prussian assault columns advanced, covered by a cloud of skirmishers whose fire picked away at our battalions. The Prussian assault columns that threatened our battalions who formed square due to the cavalry threat. As the assault columns halted to form line, the officers of our battalions rushed to order our men to do likewise along the edge of the field. In this attack, two more Prussian columns attack our far left flank, and so our battalions would form into a new line alongside the other four battalions. The fire became too much for one of our battalions, who broke and fled to the rear, recklessly over the purple and grey guts and blood of their fellow battalion men. Lobau, seeing this, thought where to deploy his last battalion of the reserve. While he thought of this, he withdrew to the nearby batteries. He then pulled back the 3rd Squadron of the 11th Chasseur au Cheval to the reserve. The 1st Battalion of the 10th Infantry Division moved up to support the front line. A courier rides in and gives a report that the line was holding, but soon they would have to withdraw. On the right side, the 1st Battalion of the 11th Enfantry de Lille was ordered to face the Prussian attackers, then the 3rd Battalion of the 11th Enfantry de Lille was sent up the road to support the left flank. A cannonball tears to their rank, and their eagle falls to be quickly snatched up by another man. In the center, men continued to trade fire, their faces black with powder smoke and their nails bled from dragging back their heavy flints. A commander rides down the ranks of the air hissing of musket balls. The 3rd Battalion of the 11th Enfantry de Ville continues to rush to support the defense on the right side as an officer rides to them to say that the withdrawal was ordered. We approach the field of honor, then. Will you do your family and your country proud? Raise high the black flag, my children. No pity, no prisoners. 
I will shoot at any man with pity. I got to find the doctor so I can find the target before a Prussian bullet or blade finds him first. Otto, I must go to rejoin my army. It was a pleasure serving with you, my friend. Take my pistol, it will do you more good than me with my wound. Good luck. You too. Is this what they do across the channel? All I can see for miles around is twisted bodies and horses and men, torn and scarred ground. If they were able to accomplish this with primitive weapons, I can't imagine what they can do with modern ones. What shattered moonscape and slaughter do they create?